Ukraine is every one of us who invests and cooperates for a better world. Ukraine is he who gives us more than he has. Those who require nothing in return. Ukraine is she who takes every opportunity. Those who don't trade lives. Those who have joined forces. Those who feed our energy. Ukraine is he who admires innovation. Those who gifted us with new gadgets. She who is in love with Ukraine. Those who keep us attractive. Ukraine is they who are not saving today. Those who save the tomorrow. And Ukraine is everyone who joins us. Thank you. And it is my great pleasure to invite to the stage Yaroslava Johnson, the president and CEO of Western NIS Enterprise Fund, and Panislava is also a core uh, organizer of Ukraine House Davos. So please welcome Panislava. The floor is yours. Let me go in here. Let the recording. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be the person leading this discussion on investment in Ukraine now and investment in the future with an esteemed panel of Rostislav Shurma. Please take the stage. Maya Sandu, the President of the Republic of Moldova. Dr. Werner Hoyer, the uh, president of the European Investment Bank. <laughs> Rusten Umerov, who will be joining us from Kiev online, is the chairman of the State Property Fund of Ukraine. And Lena Kosharna, the founding partner and CEO of Horizon Capital Associates. My name is Yaroslava Johnson. I'm the president of Western NIS Enterprise Fund since 2019, and I have been on the board of the Western NIS Enterprise Funds since 1994, when I was appointed by President Bill Clinton. Western NIS Enterprise Fund was launched in 1990. Louder. Louder? Okay. Is there a sound problem? Okay. But let me start again. My name is Yaroslava Johnson. I'm the president and CEO of the Western NIS Enterprise Fund since 2014, uh, 2015, and the um, I'm board member since 20, 1994 when I was appointed by President Bill Clinton. Western NIS Enterprise Fund launched in 1994 with $150 million from the U.S. government via the United States Agency of International Development. We initially had the ability to invest this money, $188 million accumulatively, in 136 companies which employed 23,000 employees and raised another $2.3 billion to Ukraines and to the region. I will, we will start the discussion today with a round of questions to the uh, panelists, and then we will probably have an opportunity to um, have questions from the audience. So, so let's start with Mr. Sherman. Okay. You are the deputy head of the Office of the President of Ukraine, with a primary responsibility for the economy and investment. Uh, the President of Ukraine has said many times that attracting investment was a top priority. What do you see are good investment opportunities right now during the war, and what do you anticipate would be additional investment opportunities once Ukraine is victorious? Good afternoon to everybody. So obviously, uh, the war that has happened, it has always also brought the big perspectives and big opportunities to, to our country. For example, because the, the whole landscape 
in Europe has changed. For example, the energy landscape. So Europe was traditionally very reliant on the Russian fossil fuels, 115 billion cubic meters of gas, 200 million tons of oil per annum, 100 million ton of coal every year supplied to Europe, which was up to 30 to 40 percent of the whole European power sources. Now it is not available anymore and should be replaced with something. Obviously that nobody will dig coal in in the Europe and it will be replaced with the green resources. But physically there is not enough land in Europe, not enough onshore wind. So Ukraine has a unique opportunity to become the new powerhouse for, for Europe, green powerhouse, because we have vast land, we have good insulation, we have good onshore wind, and we have good offshore wind just as we gain, regain the territories and the Black Sea. And what is really important that this segment, it provides the opportunities for both for the global majors who play really big, and for the hundreds, thousands of small and medium enterprises in Ukraine to set up the business. So we think this is one of the key segments that will maybe be up to 20 to 30 percent of the whole recovery plan in Ukraine. Green electricity for the Europe and green hydrogen for the Europe based on the location, infrastructure and natural opportunities that we have. I think this is number one and the biggest one. Number two is about the agri that we discussed in the previous panels. So we are the producer of the bulk, but there is the huge extra margin and opportunity of going to the next stage, producing meat, milk, spirits, oils, feedstock, etc. Because even if we go to the private labels, not to the brands, it provides the ec huge extra margin for, for our producers. Number three is what we traditionally had is about the IT sectors, because we have one of the best human capital in, in the world with the very strong engineering potential. And we expect that it will develop even in the pace as fast as it was before. Number four is about the infrastructure, because all the areas that were traditionally owned and operated only by the government, I think we changed the policy with the PPPs, the roads, airports, ports, will be the subject to the concessions and to, to the private capital and the structural funds in the future. And number five, this is about the, all the types of manufacturing we, where we have the strong position. It is as important geopolitically as the energy is, because one of the key topics today at the Davos is the decoupling or diversify, diver, diversifying from China and from the East Asia due to geopolitical risks. And Ukraine can be one of the locations that can offer the very good competitive advantage in multiple sectors, starting from the green steel, wood processing, chemicals, uh, or any machine building, any other industry where we have human capital and we have a lot of it, where we have natural deposits. And what is really important, we have the natural deposits of the future, of the lithium, of the graphite, of the manganese. That what would be needed for the future future industries. So, but we do understand that the big money to all these segments perhaps will come only after the end of the war. What is important now that we start with the first phase, the research phase, because everybody knows in the business that it takes six to nine months to from the idea, from the land acquisition to the real startup of the project, just the shovel project when you start constructing. So normally it takes two, three percent of the project value, but it might take up to 50 percent of the time of the implementation. So we hope that the many majors, many private entrepreneurs will already start investigating in these areas. Obviously, the business will always find the opportunities to earn, but this is what we think is really provides the strategic competitiveness of the country and opportunities that we have. How do you anticipate mitigating risk? That's obviously an issue that many investors have to investing right now during the war. Post-war, I understand, but what happens now? Yeah. So uh, just to allow some of the projects now, we have already started the pilot project with the MIGA. MIGA is a subsidiary of the World Bank, which provides the military risk guarantee at a very moderate cost. So I would say that this is the financial innovation, because this is the first time when the MIGA did this type of insurance. So the couple first uh, projects are being selected. So we will 
go through the process in the pilot way, and I think this will be the mass product for any investor that will come in Ukraine until the war is over. Because the key risk now is that your business will be physically destroyed by the Russian missile. Thank you. Um, uh, the press has written several times about meetings between the pre President Zelensky and uh, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink uh, starting in September, and the whole purpose was to attract foreign investment to Ukraine that would provide a fund for rebuilding Ukraine in the future. Can you share some information? How did this come about? And what is the ultimate goal of this entire uh, negotiations or discussions? So the ultimate goal of this project is that the companies like BlackRock, like Fidelity, like Blackstone, like Brookfields, they come to Ukraine with the multiple billion funds each. Because we understand that the value of the renovation of the country will be above 500 billion, so there are numbers between seven and 800. And we understand that the 80% of this money will be private money. And these are the best and the biggest sources of the long-term investment capital, so we want to take them on board. And to take them on board, they are not easy to take the decision. They should be very well involved in the process. They should carefully study everything. That's why we understand that it will take six, six months, nine months, a year, when they get some comfort, maybe they provide some recommendation, what we should change in our regulation, in our taxation, etc. But at the moment, the commitment of the BlackRock is to provide the consulting for us to properly structure the private funds that will fund specifically the sectors and industry that I have mentioned. Mm -hmm. There is no fixed commitment for money funds for, for specific funds from the BlackRock, and uh, we do not expect it to be in the near three months. We expect to finalize our work on the structuring, the funds, and then when the war is over, we do not wait three, four years like it was with the Marshall Plan, so that we can start immediately in the first weeks and months with the implementation. Thank you very much. Uh, President Sandu, Moldova has been among the countries with the highest number inflow of Ukrainian refugees uh, on a per capita basis and on a dollar GDP basis. Moldova has taken a staunchly pro-Ukrainian position despite the energy and trade blackmail that Russia has, has leveled against Moldova. Both Ukraine and Moldova are, have become UN, EU, EU candidate countries f following the full-scale Russian invasion. Both have futures that are intertwined somewhat. Against that backdrop, do you, what do you see as Moldova's role in reconstruction of Ukraine? First of all, um, let me start with expressing my condolences for the lost lives uh, in this horrific accident. And let me reiterate again that the uh, brave Ukrainians are defending today also my country. We feel safer thanks to the bravery and to the courageous people in Ukraine. And we appreciate it very much. And we will continue to say that Ukraine needs all the support. Um, it, it should receive all the support that it needs today because it defends its liberty, but it also uh, fights for the liberty of the entire continent. As you mentioned, we've been trying to help with the refugees, and I am grateful and I'm proud of the Moldovan people because we have managed to help the almost uh, between 600, 650,000 Ukrainian refugees which passed through Moldova. Some of them uh, spent uh, months and some of them are still in Moldova, some spend weeks, and we have managed to provide this help thanks to the Moldovan people. Um, today we have uh, about 3% of our population are refugees and will continue to, to help as much as we can. Moldova does not face military aggression again thanks to uh, the resistance um, shown by Ukraine, but we do face uh, the uh, hybrid war um, elements, and we are trying to uh, keep the country stable because we do we do believe that it is it is important to keep Moldova stable and democratic, both for our own sake but also for Ukraine. And it is extremely important for us for Ukraine to be uh, free, strong, and prosperous and democratic. This is the only way we we can develop. Um, 
we have been trying to help with the solidarity lanes, mm -hmm. and here I mean the platform that we uh, have created to help the uh, exports of grain from uh, Ukraine through the uh, only port that we have, but also on the route to Romania, and will continue to provide such help. Uh, we have been trying to, to help with the import of inputs, and uh, the, especially the gasoline, the much needed gasoline. Um, we want to participate in common energy projects. We need to diversify, and Ukraine is doing the same. Um, and we are ready to uh, work on um, electricity projects on balancing. We are ready to work on renewable uh, storage and production. And of course, we want to develop our um, infrastructure in common within common projects uh, with Ukraine when it comes to railways, transport, everything that is going to link our two countries with the European Union because this is where we're heading and this is where we want our economies to be, um, uh, to be developing uh, towards. Thank you. Um, Ukrainians, of course, will be eternally grateful to Moldovans for opening their doors and their hearts and their generous help for Ukrainian people. And I think that's, uh, that shows the sign of a good neighbor. He mentioned that the economies of the two countries have certain overlaps and sort of spillovers. Uh, what opportunities do you see for investors going forward? I think the biggest news here is that our countries uh, have gotten the European perspective. And I think uh, we can say with certainty that both countries are going to become EU members sooner than many of you in this room might think, and I strongly believe this. Um, so this is the biggest uh, positive news for us, but also for the potential investors. Of course, uh, the uh, war has changed things, and the competitive advantages that we had uh, before the war uh, are not any more um, the same. But um, we do believe that Ukraine is going to win this war, and we be do believe that reconstru reconstruction is going to start, and we do believe that those investors which um, are not afraid of the risks will count on a higher premium. And this uh, means uh, construction, this means energy, this means green energy, this means IT. Um, and then for some of these areas, uh, it can start immediately because, uh, for instance, IT is a sector resilient to the war and, and things can start now. So I believe that the courageous investors and those who are looking for a higher premium, they should start now. They should have the courage to go to Lviv, to uh, Kyiv, uh, to Odessa, to Chisinau, um, to uh, get contacts uh, to prepare for this uh, period which is going to come, the, the reconstruction. And I do believe that such investors are going to have a competitive advantage when this uh, big, massive reconstruction process starts. So I do see this two big advantages. Our EU perspective, and I want to repeat that this is serious and this is going to happen sooner than you might think. And, and second, the reconstruction process that uh, mm -hmm. I also believe strongly will, will start soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hoyer, um, the European Investment Bank is the lending arm of the European Union and the biggest multilateral financial institution in the world. It, the bank has publicly condemned Russia's invasion in Ukraine and uh, has made a clear indication that the institution stands by Ukraine. Can you tell us some of the details of the Ukraine Solidarity Urgent Response Package? How much has been dispersed? What, what was its purpose originally? How much was it dispersed? How do you see it working in Ukraine going forward? Well, thank you very much for inviting me, but before I re respond to your question, let me also express uh, my condolences uh, to the Ukrainian people, to the President, but also to you, Mr. Shurma. I'm aware that you lost one of your closest friends today in this tragic accident. And let me congratulate President Sandu on the, on the achievements in Moldova and the resolve with which you are on the European track, just like, uh, like Ukraine. And that's key because that is going to be a game changer. And we have seen 30 years ago how much of a game changer the way towards the European Union can be. Look where Poland stands today. 
Poland is economically one of the most advanced countries in the European Union now, and I'm not talking about the Baltic seas, Baltic sea states, they're even, even further when it comes in particular to modernization of our industries. So uh, this is a, a road to go, and uh, sometimes when I'm in, in, in big events on, on Ukraine, uh, we talk about one very, very important dimension all the time, from morning to night and from night to morning, that's the military dimension. And it's important that we need to bring all, about all the support possible. But on the other hand, the biggest contribution to the resilience of the Ukrainian people comes from the functioning of the economy. Mm -hmm. And we have to do everything in order to keep that economy functioning. And of course, the war has not only produced terrible human losses and victims and disadvantages, but it has also shown this resolve and this determination to take it. And I think, uh, as we have said, uh, we know very well uh, these people, uh, with their courage and determination, they don't only defend Ukrainian interests and uh, lives, they defend our values. So we take that very, very seriously. And the European Investment Bank, the EU Bank, has a clean record on this. We began our cooperation with Ukraine immediately after the beginning of the independence. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, we took a strategic decision, which was separate from the rest of the Union at that time, because obviously they did not see the seriousness of the situation. We, after the invasion of Crimea, stopped our business with Russia. And that was a huge program, the Partnership for Modernization. Mm -hmm. If you look at the competitiveness of Russian industry, then you get aware how important that program would be. So we had then more funds to go into Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, and uh, we could do more in Ukraine. Well, after the invasion now, nine months ago, uh, we were in the uh, critical situation that we thought, OK, immediate help is necessary, but we cannot look around to find new projects. We need to help with what is needed right now. So within one week, we dispersed close to 700 million euros for immediate help in order to, to get the, the supplies for medical, uh, for schools, for all these things. But this can only be the first step concrete investment project, and we are an investment bank, mm -hmm. a project financier, not a budget financier. So the finance minister, although I'm afraid of him, because he's going to be one of my governors very soon, uh, and the finance ministers of the European Union are the governors of the European Investment Bank, but I cannot help him with his budget, but I can help him with financing good projects. And when we see the Ukraine coming in, we see one big strength coming in. I mean, there is a lot that needs to be caught up. There are lots of be, that it needs to be rebuilt. And we should not talk about these huge amounts of billions and trillions all the time that is more a deterrent than an encouragement. We should talk about the capacity which is there from the natural resources and from the and, and setup of the country and the intelligence of the people, and in particular from the strength of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So I am sure that once the door is open, the Ukrainian will make the best of it. In that context, the EIB, I think, should help much more. We have been very active in, in, in projects from, from uh, subway systems to uh, all kinds of things on the, in the energy front. Hospitals in particular, we have rebuilt bridges which the Russians had destroyed, and we thought we need to rebuild them now because these bridges are needed in order to keep the economy in that region around that city uh, functioning. So this has, can, can be done, but we need much more support. When we as a triple, bank, triple A bank, which needs to borrow up to 100 billion euros on the capital markets every year in order to finance our projects, we need to, save, to secure that A, these are good projects. This is why we offer also to Ukraine advisory capacity and technical support. But we also need to be sure that we go, in, go into risky business. The bridge I mentioned might be destroyed in a couple of months again. And the politicians in the European Union should not be afraid of that if you distribute the burden of that potential loss equally around them. So we need, in other words, guarantees. Mm -hmm. People are much too, talking much too much about capital and uh, capital injections. What we need is not capital. Mind this is sensational for multilateral banks. We do not need capital. We need guarantees. And this is where all of you can help, because put pressure on the politicians to make sure that this bank can continue its work in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, uh, EIB provides loans for the private sector 
and intermediate loans to SMEs and mid caps and equity focused on venture capital, infrastructure, environmental. How much? Of, how many of these projects are open to Ukraine right now, and uh, or, when, or will they be available at some point if they're not open now? Well, the, what has been decided about Ukraine, by the way, also the public sector, that has been done and has been done successfully. So we're quite happy with it. We can, we can and we should do much more. Uh, the, 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 the financing corner that we need to get around, I, I've just described. But uh, the good thing is that there is no lack of good project ideas in Ukraine. And it doesn't take foreigners to go there and tell them what to do. The ideas come from, from the Ukrainians themselves, and then we check it, give advice if necessary. If the project is stupid, then we will not finance it. But if there is a chance that it is going to be a contribution to progress in Ukraine, then we have open doors. OK, thank you. Could someone hook in Mr. Umarov from Kiev? Yes, certainly. You have one, please. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you virtually. Um, uh, Mr. Romero, <laughs> you have an interesting background. You were born in Crimea. You were a member of parliament of Ukraine. You also, as soon as the war started, you became the chief negotiator on behalf of President Zelensky. And now you're the chairman of the State Property Fund. What a career. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what is your role as negotiator? How, what are you doing actually for Ukraine? And who are you negotiating with? Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, to to become a Rostom Umarov, you have to be born in deportation in Samarkand. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, and then return to your ancestral land in Crimea after deportation, become an IDP, refugee, and then uh, being uh, those people who were uh, filled there from Russia, uh, uh, face the discriminatory actions, but learn how to withstand and fight and to protect your own rights. Uh, become a student in Kiev, learn what is EU and NATO, and design your architecture of your uh, future nation. So basically, this is my background. As for the negotiation part of yours, uh, it started in 2014 since uh, uh, Crimea, where I'm originally from, was uh, temporarily occupied. So at that time, there was no central government. Uh, there was no collective West uh, strong response. So that is why we started our strategy at that time to resist by all means available, uh, starting from non-violent and then uh, to, uh, with the arms in all territory, advocate uh, globally uh, to become EU NATO country and hopefully one day G20 country. So as from 24th of February, uh, Everything changed. The dimension changed. The scale, uh, scale changed. So it became from regional to global. So uh, the leadership of Ukraine, President Zelensky and his team, uh, uh, architecturized the uh, global security. And uh, they showed an exemplary resistance uh, when state officials, state apparatus, defense forces, state-owned enterprises, partners and people of Ukraine were aligned in one mission alone, to defend country, to defend European continent, and to defend the global security. So at this stage, of course, uh, our work was focused to the civil corridor that was uh, up to uh, 10 regions temporarily occupied. We uh, withstanded them, uh, kicked them out, and we provided the civil corridor uh, from the temporary occupied territory to civilians. Up to 400 to 500,000 civilians have crossed from these temporary occupied territories to Ukrainian corridor, uh, to Ukrainian uh, controlled territories. We uh, made uh, peace talks to show the world that we are capable, civilized European country, and uh, able to negotiate, and uh, we've also uh, been able to bring back uh, 1,500 prisoners of war. Uh, we also showed that uh, there is a green initiative, and President Zelensky uh, just recently on G19 uh, have uh, shown that there is a peace plan uh, with 10 steps. Uh, so those are our uh, areas where we negotiated. As a state property fund, 
I've just been appointed just a couple months ago, but uh, for the last 130 days, we've analyzed that uh, many discussions are being done on state property fund. It's like kind of Ukrainian so on fund. We have 3,600 state-owned enterprises. Uh, Fortunately, we will be liquidating and uh, filing for bankruptcy uh, 2,600 uh, actually not existing enterprises. Uh, there are some uh, on temporary occupied territories and uh, rest we will be privatizing. So basically speaking, as uh, as a chairman for the uh, for the last 130 days, we've analyzed, uh, we're capable, and we will be sending 95% to privatization. We will be 2% uh, of the state-owned enterprises will be managed by asset management, and uh, remaining we will be creating a land bank and a real estate investment trust. Wow, that's a major, major assignment. I, I've been in Ukraine for many years, and I've heard about these 3,000 enterprises for many years. Everyone's promised to liquidate them, and no one's managed to do it. I hope you do it. Good luck to you. Now, I have Thank another you. question for you. Uh, the press has said that you've been also negotiating with sovereign wealth funds, and most recently with ADQ, the sovereign wealth fund of the United Arab Emirates, which has about $200 billion in assets. Can you share some light on this negotiation? What is the goal of, um, of setting up a sovereign wealth fund for Ukraine? Sure. Uh, our organic partners is North American European Union. Uh, and we've discussed with DFC, USID, IMF, uh, all the investment, major investment banks in Europe and uh, uh, US. Uh, but we also said that we need a growth market and uh, we need a state policy towards the Middle East, North Africa and uh, other uh, areas. So basically, we met with uh, a public investment fund, uh, ADQ, Mubadala, Adia, Qatar Investment Authority. The focuses were that uh, they are now involved in also uh, providing the assistance on conflict resolution. Uh, secondly, they're involved in uh, humanitarian aid, and we're thinking uh, if they could uh, provide us assistance uh, in uh, advisory on establishing a sovereign fund. In addition, uh, their best practices, uh, they've uh, also, wanna, they want to participate in privatization. So basically, we are analyzing new investments and financial instruments and uh, investment programs with them. So uh, at this stage, those are the areas that we're covering with them. What benefit will a sovereign wealth fund do for Ukraine? Why would you, should Ukraine have one? If we would uh, analyze the 2% of the uh, assets we will leave in our hands at the moment, so which comprises up to 70 to 100 companies, uh, we, of course, uh, seen that state-owned enterprises not all the time show the bad experiences because after 24th of February, we show the resistance and most of the uh, state apparatus, state officials and state-owned enterprises show a uh, huge uh, resistance. So that's why it's a critical. Of course, the governance will be focused on the governance and this uh, new Ukrainian uh, sovereign fund will be uh, managing those uh, assets that will not be privatized. In addition, it it may become a platform for the new investments to come and a new partnership uh, and investment programs with other sovereign funds, uh, pension funds, insurance uh, companies, private equity companies. Thank you very much. Um, now to Ms. Kosharny. It's strange for me to call Lena Ms. Kosharny because we've worked together for 30 years, but in any event, Ms. Kosharny. In the middle of the war uh, in September, you raised $125 million out of a target of 250 for your next growth fund. Uh, it, it was a daunting task, and everyone said it can't be done during a war, and yet you did it. How did you do it? Thank you so much. I'm going to say Yaroslava, not <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Um, before, I, before I answer the question, I just want to say how absolutely impressed I am by the resilience um, on a tragic day like today, Mr. Shurma, Mr. Umarov, um, all of the Ukrainian people, everyone who is here in support today, I'm one of the Ukraine House Davos organizers. We had so many prime ministers, presidents, high level officials. Thank you, President Sandu, for your condolences. It's very important for everyone. And what is um, absolutely important, the first message before I answer the question, is that for those that think that 
all that's happening in Ukraine is that there are humanitarian, you know, posts and, and, and lineups of folks throughout the entire country um, getting aid. That's not what's happening in Ukraine. The business community is resilient. The business community is strong. Um, they are providing the services nonstop. We see the connectivity, we see the banking sector, we see the trade, we see the logistics infrastructure, and it is that Ukrainian resilience that's powering it on the ground. So the most important message that I want to say is that please get the capital and get the the resources into the hands of Ukrainians and they will do all the rest. Um, the second message I want to say is that the last time I saw Mr. Shurma, Mr. Umarov, we were meeting right before, remember, Rosislav, the, the, we were in Kiev in November right before our American Chamber of Commerce dinner. We were so excited. We had organized the first dinner for Ambassador Bridget Brink and 200 CEOs were coming in the middle of a war to have Thanksgiving dinner together. That was the day when 80 rockets, Iranian drones, um, throughout the country, nationwide strikes, and we were in the, in the catacombs of the President's administration where Mr. Shudma and Mr. Amedov were working nonstop on business investment economic issues. It doesn't matter where people are, they can be in bomb shelters. And by the way, we had that dinner. We were not gonna let Mr. Putin, we were not gonna let him ruin Thanksgiving dinner, 200 CEOs, the ambassador within hours later got together in the basement of the Intercontinental and had that dinner. And that's, I think, the spirit of resilience that we see in the business and economy. Um, how did we raise that fund? We started in October 2021, and, um, and we have 1.2 billion under management. We typically raise funds 200, 250 million. We started the fundraising for our $250 million fund. We were so excited when DG came forward and said, we'd like to allocate 20 million of your 250 by the end of the year, despite the fact that every day there was stories about thousands, you know, 110,000 on the border, 120,000 Russian troops on the border. They said, we want to allocate this year, let's sign the subscription docs before year end. We did that with them, thanks to their backing, and then we had two conditions. Um, condition number one was we had to re reach 100 million to accept that subscription, and condition number two was it had to happen before September 30th. We were all set. We we're going to have the first closing in March, of course, February 24th. All of our attention was on the safety, security of people, of the companies that we back, of 26,000 people throughout the country, evacuating people, working with them on their business models, helping them to move truckloads of equipment from. Kiev to Western Ukraine, doing everything possible to support them. In May, we looked at the numbers. We saw that the companies had grown almost 30% since the full-fledged invasion. We saw the resilience of the export companies, of the tech champions, and we went back to our investors. The first question I got was, let's do a relocation fund to relocate Ukrainian businesses out of the country. And we said, no way. There's no way we're going to do that. We need the Ukrainian businesses on the ground, operating resilient and more capital. So we, we went back to all of our existing LPs and we are so happy and delighted, all of them backed. Um, I've seen EBRD, FMO, DG, as I mentioned, the Swiss through CFEM, Western NAS, and Rockefeller Foundation helped us get to 125 million. We had a historic signing with the, with the President of Ukraine, who is complimenting the investors for not waiting for the war to be over and for committing capital for Ukrainian businesses right now. So I guess I, my message really is to, to folks, mm -hmm. don't wait. These companies need this capital now, and it really matters right now. I think after reconstruction starts, after the war is over, and by the way, reconstruction's already starting, the Ukrainians are funding it and and doing what it takes now to rebuild Bucha, to pee in all these other cities. But I think there's gonna be a lineup after the war ends. I think those, I think that Ukraine is watching, taking notes, and understands that those who are brave enough, those who are saying, you know what, 
We want to be with you now, shoulder to shoulder. We're willing to take the risk. We're willing to make the arguments to our boards. We're willing to stick our neck out because it's the right thing to do. And in 10 years, we don't want to be the institution that looks back and people ask, what did you do for Ukraine at that moment? Well, we waited until the war was over. You can't erase history. Uh, thank you. Several months ago in Toronto, um, Prime Minister Schmihal said that the first to invest will be the one who benefits most. Uh, do you share his perspective? Um, do you think investment now is a good idea? And you seem to be, but perhaps you can elaborate on what you think is the, makes it worthwhile. I'm, I'm so happy that he said those words and, and what we saw. I had the pleasure of speaking at the Rebuild Ukraine conference and many conferences in Lugano and others. And the sentiment across the board is that people are looking. It is important. It is important that they start coming to Ukraine, that they start looking at the opportunities, that they start making the relationships. And of course, it takes time. It was exactly what Mr. Sharma said. You know, with BlackRock, the process is starting now. Understandably that the fund doesn't get formed tomorrow, but everybody, you know, you've got to put in the work, you've got to put in the relationships, and it really matters now. So obviously, Yaroslav, I do believe in that statement. I do believe that now's the time, and I do believe that, that there will be a lineup, and it will be a very different picture after the war ends. Great, thank you. Now we have a few minutes left for questions from the audience. There are microphones available, so please raise your hand. A microphone will be delivered to you. There's one question here, and then we'll be happy to uh, take the questions. Where's the microphone? Nika, can you please give one the microphone to this gentleman? You'll be next. He's first. And there's a gentleman. Yeah. The gentleman at the back, maybe come forward a little bit. Uh, yeah, we can't even see you. Konstantin uh, Magalitsky, <clears throat> Green Ukraine Recovery Fund. We are investment fund which we are fundraising now for recovery of Ukraine in terms of renewables and infrastructure. <clears throat> I have a question to the president of EIB. Uh, how do you see the role um, of development institutions, EIB in particular, in terms of financing the private sector? Because now, uh, the development institutions were focused for the obvious reasons on saving Ukrainian economy, right? Uh, Ukrainian railways, Ukrainian energy system, and did fantastic job beyond any expectations. But so far, the private sector got, by some estimates, way, way much smaller amounts, again, for the obvious reasons, right? But how do you see this situation in terms of financing for the private sector and for investment funds in particular, as Lena mentioned, uh, and you answered? Um, how do you see the situation going forward, and in particular the plans by your institutions? Thank you very much. I start with a maybe unexpected response. Ukraine is not different from other European countries. Of course, you need a functioning electricity supply. You need functioning bridges. You need functional uh, uh, rail systems. But the backbone of the economy is are the SMEs. Is the, the middle Mittelstand in my language, and this means that we need to support them. We have widen the programs for this. Also our subsidiary, the European Investment Fund, which provides SME loans and all these things and guarantees uh, and uh, securitizations in this field is active now in Ukraine. And I think it is key. I mean, as, 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 imp as important as the big players are in Ukraine, and they are very s close to the state, which doesn't make things easier, the backbone of the economy of Ukraine will be the, the brains and the activities of the individual entrepreneurs. Kathy? Okay, there's somebody there. Okay, sure, sure, I didn't see Hi, um, Fabian Kinzelmann from Handelszeitung in Zurich. Um, I think the Swiss government just funded its first big reconstruction project in Ukraine with like Schwihak AG um, and a 14 million project for railway systems in Ukraine. But it seems like the company is afraid to talk about this um, because they are afraid to lose like some business maybe in Asia, in India, in China. Is this a challenge you are also facing with other companies? I don't think that there is 
the risk that you are taking if talking about the only direct uh, risk might be about the Russia but I think all the civilized companies have decided or moved out from Russia so I don't see any contradiction to doing business in Ukraine in China in India in China Southeast Asia in China in, in Ukraine uh, so simply I think there was the lack of communication public and nothing more and how important is the Swiss project in Ukraine for you it's a small start. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much and thank you for this outstanding panel. I would ask the question maybe to Lena Kajarny and the uh, Mr. President of EAB. So the great tool of economic recovery and not just post-war recovery, but during uh, during the war recovery is here. It's private business and Ukrainian companies were rushing to uh, restore the operations in the liberated uh, cities and territories like one of uh, West, uh, one of your funds investment, uh, Rosatka is an example, Novaposhta, Ukrposhta, supermarkets, they're doing great job. My question here, what are the tools you see to streamline access to finance for the SMEs and private sectors? Because some of the companies, they do have the capital, but to have the fast revival, we need this streamlined access, not two years access, not a year and a half access, but really on a snap. Are there tools of financing known to the world to help the SMEs and uh, maybe larger business move ahead on the liberated territories. Thank you. Well, let me start, if I may, uh, and say uh, this is a bloody difficult question because one thing is for sure, the multilateral institutions and the, also the, the big national institutions who are of assistance to Ukraine are always too slow. I take the blame on my own institution. We are too slow. Before, between origination of a project and the disbursement, you have sometimes between one and two years. And that is simply, in such a situation, not acceptable. Okay, that can be mitigated and, and, and reduced. The second point is we need to have access, access to institutions below the level of an international bank like a fund structure. And that is developing very quickly now because it is interesting. And thirdly, I think it is key to encourage the Ukrainian banks to go into a direct uh, co cooperation with, uh, the, uh, with the big international institutions, be they private or public, because uh, we need to have the banking expertise on the ground and they must be Ukrainians and that must be understood by the Ukrainian customers and therefore I think this cooperation between the big international players and the local players in Ukraine is crucial. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hoyer. I will Wait, add sorry, to that. Sorry, may, may, sorry. Yes, yes, sorry. I, I, sorry. Catch the word again. I was happy be, about your question because one thing, when I'm in the political circles and I participate in all European councils or European finance ministers' meetings or foreign ministers' meetings, whatever, they talk about the reconstruction of Ukraine. They put huge numbers into the, into the, into the plan and say, we're talking about billions and trillions of reconstruction. But that is the future, and it will certainly come. But now it's the time let me put it in an economic terms, to save the money. Mm -hmm. Because everything that we will not do now in terms of investment will cost 10 times as much when the, the ink on the treaty, peace treaty is dry. And just to add to that, indeed, as Dr. Hoyer said, it is a very challenging question because, you know, the perspective from the ground, first of all, the 579 program was a lifeline for SMEs, many SMEs. I mean, this was billions of hryvnia that were dispersed in the 579 program. And, you know, for, for others, and of course it's not available to, to everyone, you know, you're facing the fact that, you know, you've got interest rates at 25% for hryvnia denominated loans you have financial intermediaries who are trying to do everything not to disperse, who maybe will say they're dispersing, but they're not dispersing, in fact, and certainly you know, only working with current clients, not extending new client relationships. And I think that's also, Dr. Hoare, it was, you asked for our help. We asked for the help of, of the institutions who are funding financial intermediaries to really put the pressure on that they're on the ground, they should be dispersing, and if they've got credit facilities that have been 
provided by institutions, they need to get them out the door. They need to be measured on that. They need to be, we run our businesses all with KPIs, with metrics. You know, set KPIs, set metrics. They, if they have a 50 million or 100 million or 200 million credit, they should be dispersing it. It's not enough to do commitments. Commitments don't matter. What matters is disbursements and how much money is getting out the door to those businesses that are powering Ukraine's resilience. Exactly. Okay, we have a question here in the first row. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Catherine Valinga. I'm CEO of Zirkova Vodka. Uh, we've discovered the origins of vodka in modern day Ukraine. We've imported, we, we produce our brand, all suppliers, all materials in Ukraine for the last 15 years and have literally brought hundreds of, of containers out. Mr. Sherma, my, my, my question is for you. So again, I'm so sorry for the loss of your friend, for the loss of, loss of your colleagues, the tragedy. Um, it's really about what you said about all normal companies have left Russia. Do we have a, we know we see the Yale University, we monitor it all, but I want to know how many of those companies also exited Ukraine and how many of those companies have taken their exit and put it into Ukraine? Do we have a sense of that? Do we have the metrics for that? Or are they just, is it all about Russia and not about Ukraine? Okay. So let's start from the simplest. So I think the, the question, the answer is close to zero. The business that was removed from Russia and then relocated to Ukraine. Uh, I see that there is, we see that there is the opportunity, the big part of this business will be ultimately relocated to Ukraine because it was located there to supply the regional market and Ukraine can provide ultimately the same opportunities that Russia provided to them. But we believe that will happen maybe a bit later after the war is over because these companies, these are industrial companies and uh, corporates in specific segments which are very risk uh, diverse. So, and they are the latest who will take the decision to invest in, in the matrix that, that, that we see. They will come, but they will come a little bit later. Obviously, there are dozens of uh, Western companies that have still not left Russia. I don't want to put the specific names. I would say that we are almost in the daily communication with their management, pushing them, and there is the progress. There are the companies that didn't do it in the first months of war, but did it in, in June, in September, in November. So I believe that one after another, we will push all of them out of Russia. And not just because we push them, because they understand that this is not in line with their principles to do, to do the business there. Okay. There's another question. Could you uh, microphone to the gentleman in the second row, and then, then you'll get yours. Okay. Distinguished experts, uh, I'm Alexei Zmerinetsky, MP, Ukrainian MP, co-head of um, Parliamentary Caucus uh, Strategic Foresight. And uh, I want to ask you about your methodology in assessment of risks and uh, critical conditions uh, to decide invest or not invest in Ukraine. For, for example, uh, we did the research with your commission, uh, UNTP and uh, parliament, uh, some parliamentarians from British and uh, we see uh, different scenarios. In some scenarios, uh, war uh, will be for uh, two years. In some, for 10 years and five years, uh, we, we see the risk of uh, critical outflow of Ukrainian people, for example, and, or uh, very long risk of uh, uh, Russian invasion uh, uh, will be repeated. Uh, and what, what scenario is uh, based scenario for you, and in, in which scenarios uh, you decide you will decide not to invest? I, I will say this: that that if everyone operated from the standpoint that there are so many risks that you can do nothing, nothing would ever get done. It's important to assess risks. It's important to try to mitigate them. But if you ask any of the entrepreneurs that we talked, and we have over 200 entrepreneurs that we're in discussion with right now, all of them are looking forward to the future, are doing everything that they can to mitigate risk, to capitalize on opportunities, to pivot, and it's just astounding. I mean, in our in our portfolio that we, we look at the current, I'll give you, I mean, I think it's, it's important, the actual facts. If you look at our $200 million fund, which we raised, you know, closing 2017, and, and it's interesting because investors are so 
surprised that it's doing as well as it's doing. And we say it was raised, deployed, and invested at a time of war. I mean, this war started in February 2014. It didn't start in February 2022. It started eight years ago. And these, you know, this power of these visionary entrepreneurs who, who you look at all the unicorns that over the last eight years have been established in Ukraine, those people understand the risk, but they also understand the human capital, the people, how resilient they are, how they can do so much with much less than um, their Western counterparts may have. You look at the IT companies. I mean, while others are slamming into the wall because they can't raise the next financing round, you see Ukrainian companies that that have are cash flow positive, are profitable, or they're doing everything possible, and they don't 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 depend on the next financing round. So, I think I think there's something very special in Ukraine, and and every. You, you, of course, I'm not trying to downplay risk. I'm saying that you're ultimately backing people. You're not backing a model, a risk model. You're backing a person, their idea, their belief, their team, the human capital, what they've created. And that's who we partner with. And those are the vision entrepreneurs. Those, those are the people who, like, you know, Alexander Konotovsky at Ajax Systems. I mean, for him to move, you know, 35, 20-ton trucks in 35 days and set up his production platform in Western Ukraine and then expand to a second platform. I mean, that's things that people do over years. They plan this move, et cetera. They do it over a year or two. He did it in 35 days. So it's so much about the power of those entrepreneurs. And I think Ukrainian entrepreneurs are the best in the world. We have one final question. and. I'm uh, uh, from Kony from Ferexpo. Uh, we are a mining company in the uh, Poltava Oblast, uh, employing 10,000 people, generating 3% of exports, and uh, currently operating with uh, one out of four pelletizer. And also want to thank uh, that's only possible due to the commitment of the staff and, and the great support from the authorities on local and federal level. What I wanted to say is, uh, as a company of this size and complexity, we are obviously uh, very much also dependent on the proper functioning of the judiciary. Um, if you have a company of that size, you, you are dealing with the authorities on all levels, administrative level, on with uh, courts, and I think it's super important that uh, uh, these courts even in these circumstances, work uh, uh, properly and the rule of law is, is respected. The question I have maybe to Mr. Umerov, uh, I think it's very important that there is a, a, the greatest level of transparency possible when we come to martial law. I think everybody understands you imposed it. So far, to the best of my knowledge, you have nationalized five companies. Can you say something about the criteria you apply in, in applying that, the, the martial law? Uh, Thank you. I think I'll take this question, Rustam. Yes. So, yes, yes. So I, I do understand why is it. So uh, first of all, everybody should know that the private property in Ukraine is untouchable, and there won't be the voluntary approach to see some of the assets. So full stop. Not not to do any speculations. So uh, the only reason why the martial law was applied to the specific companies was because there was huge risk to the national security. I provided the specific examples. For the oil company, they refused to supply the oil products to the Ukrainian army. For the engine company, they were supplying the engines to the Russian company. For the trucks, they stopped the plant and they hardly produced any military truck for 10 years, maybe a couple of dozens, while our, our army needs 40,000 tons, 40,000 pieces of trucks. So it was absolutely logical, it was the only reason. And uh, just to, to be absolutely clear, there, there won't be speculation on the martial law. It will be applied only to the cases where there is a risk for the national security. But it will be applied immediately. We apparently have some few more minutes left, and I actually have a question for President Sandu. Uh, it looks like uh, Ukraine and, and Moldova are both headed towards the EU, EU candidacy. What do you think becoming an EU candidate means for Moldova? Well, for us, this is the only chance to survive as a democracy. Uh, this is the chance to stay part of the free world. <laughs> and uh, this is the chance to become uh, a richer country, because we see, we saw 
the process of convergence of the countries in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, how it developed and how quickly, so this is the, the quickest economic grow model, mm -hmm. and, and this is what we expect to happen to our countries. Rostislav, uh, what do you think is going to happen to Ukraine with the EU accession possibility? How does that look from your perspective? I think it's uh, the best stimulus for the economy that we can get, and I think that the, the best item of it is the market, because Ukraine is extremely competitive in many products that we have discussed, and if we have the access to the 500 million high net worth people market, then we'll have the real boom. And the second is about the risks and about the price of the money, which will make 10 times more projects profitable in Ukraine that are not profitable, taking into consideration the current cost of capital. Any more questions from the floor? Yes. Right here, a microphone, please. I have a question to uh, President Sandu and also to Rostislav Shurma. Uh, uh, continuing the, the issue of uh, European integration, uh, like both countries, Moldova and Ukraine, need to attract uh, private investment, and uh, uh, for this you need to have a uh, supportive regulatory environment. However, like if we move fast to uh, to the EU uh, laws, it means uh, like heavily regulated environment. Uh, how uh, like both Rostislav on the side of Ukrainian government and you uh, as a president of Moldova plan to balance it in this highly risk situation that we, uh, that both countries are now. Thank you. Um. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So obviously we have to do the full harmonization for the old regulations maybe within this year if we want to follow the aggressive terms for the EU accession as we plan. But what we should understand that besides the EU accession we'll have the period of intensive rebuilding the country for the next five, seven, ten years. And to make this rebuilding process fast we should simplify many processes. So if you take, for example, the environmental processes for the construction of the new comp new industrial production, new energy production, so in, in Europe it can take years. We will do the temporary solutions when it should take months, for the five, seven years. For example, if you want to rebuild the infrastructure, you need to rebuild the roads, bridges, the grids, the lines. You need to take the land quickly to put the line, to put the road there. Obviously, it will assume some temporary procedure for the five, seven years to a very quick and simplified seizure of the land to build the infrastructure. So we believe it will be full harmonization with some pre-agreed exclusions for the intensive recovery period. Intensive recovery period. Well, we, are, we actually believe that the benefits are going to be higher than the costs, and we also have a pretty... Uh, pretty big agenda on harmonization. We will have to... Uh, to do it better than what the country has been doing in the last 10 years because this was not enough. But again, our commitment is very strong and we do believe that the benefits are going to be higher than the costs you are talking about. Do we have any other questions from the floor? There's a all the way in the back. There's a gentleman with a hand raised up. Hello, James O'Brien. Um, I just have a question uh, regarding LNG. Um, so my background's in energy, and I'd like to understand uh, from the panel, and in particular from Werner, uh, what type of supports might be in place for Ukraine uh, to diversify their energy supply, um, in particular gas supply. Uh, I think LNG has proven itself as a saviour for Europe uh, over the last uh, nine, ten months, and uh, I'd like to understand what type of supports the EIB could envisage, uh, and, in, and also to the other panel, what type of supports could be put in place uh, to help Ukraine diversify their energy supply and bring LNG to Ukraine, right through to Southeast Europe, for example? We are totally open on this issue, also in, in Western Europe. That was not always the case, but now we are in. And there is no reason why we should not be in for that in Eastern Europe as well. We have to see that our commitment to help our economies to get out of fossil fuels remains. So we will not support any installations, any infrastructure that at the end of the day will not be able to also transform into hydrogen transporting and further developing uh, installations. So if that is the case, then I think there is no reason why we should not support that. Any other questions? There's a go. There's another hand. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, thank no, no, we need a microphone because other people can get up. Yeah. Pass uh, the microphone uh, on to this gentleman. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Ukrainian IT industry because when we talk about rebuilding Ukraine and investments in Ukraine, there is a lot of attention to the infrastructure, energy, and so on. But currently, IT is the main driver of the Ukrainian economy. So, how do you see the tools uh, that you are going to be to Im that are going to be employed in order to facilitate development of Ukraine? and IT sector. Thank you. I'm not an expert on this, if I, if I may begin. Maybe I should leave it to, to the people to my left. But one thing is quite clear. Even if you're not an expert in IT technology, or IT technical side of the whole thing, then there is one thing where I'm absolutely sure, when it comes into the intellectual part of the deal, then you are on a safe ground in Ukraine. And this is what people on the IT industry, in my view, have totally detected. And they have detected in other parts of Central and Eastern Europe as well. And Ukraine is just going to follow that course. I think Ukraine will be one of the key providers for top technology for the entire European Union. A question to President Sandu. I'm Adi Winkler, journalist from Austria. Um, President, um, uh, can you precise your um, personal view and timetable for Moldavia's um, um, coming into the European community, please. Well, of course, this is not my decision. Um, it's a decision of um, your leaders, but uh, I do believe this should happen fast because this is going to help save our democracies, and I think uh, the democratic world needs uh, the democratic consolidation and needs to help all the countries which uh, authentically are trying to build democracies. And I do believe that EU is going to be stronger having both Ukraine and Moldova as member states. Thank you very much. This has been a very nice uh, stellar panel and nice audience participation. I want to ta thank everybody. Uh, Rostislav Shurma, who had to leave, President Sandu, Dr. Hoyer, Ruslan, Umerov is in Ukraine, and Lena Kusharna, thank you very much for participating in today's panel. Thank you very thank you much. So much. Great pleasure. Thank you.